Hello, <laughs> welcome. Uh, as I was just, you know, described, I uh, used to be the former deputy ambassador of North Korea to United uh, the Kingdom, and I defected to South Korea for freedom uh, in 2016. And today, I'm very much, you know, honored to tell about North Korea. As you know, it is very difficult to understand about North Korea because North Korea is a place where you uh, could not go or, you know, it seems a very remote, you know, the place. So that's why it is very difficult to understand about North Korea. So I would like to tell you some of the, you know, the main uh, aspects of North Korea. First, uh, I want to tell you that North Korea claims to be the legitimate government of the entire Korean peninsula. Uh, that is very interesting, you know, in this world, you know, no country in the world claims uh, to be the owner of the territory which is actually governed by the other state. So, but even though in Korean peninsula, North and South Korea as well, uh, claimed to be the only legitimate government of the whole Korean Peninsula. So, because of this claim, uh, there are a lot of you know uh, the problems which the world uh, cannot understand are very real. So, because of the, this claim, the claim, uh, North Korea has very peculiar and interesting military structure. So, North Korea has nuclear weapons even though it is very small. And North Korea has a second highest number of military and paramilitary personnel with a total of 7.7 .7 million. You understand, North Korea has nuclear weapons and is the country with the second highest number of military and the paramilitary personnel with a total of 7.7 .7 million active, reserve, and paramilitary personnel. So it is approximately 30% of its population. And its active duty army of 1.28 million soldiers, that is the fourth largest in the world, consisting of 5% of its population. So that's why in North Korea's daily life, Great investments is going on on military daily. That is one of the reasons North Korea is so poor. Human rights. According to uh, UN, you know, the uh, investigation uh, which took place in 2014, uh, the UN described uh, North Korea as a kind of, you know, a country uh, with the gravity, scale, and nature of these violations uh, reveal a state that does not have any parallel in the contemporary world. So that is one of the reasons North Korea cannot open its doors to the world community and the people uh, feel a very difficulty to visit North Korea. Now I'm going to tell about political structure of North Korea which is very difficult to understand. North Korea functions as a highly centralized one-party system. There is a constitution, yes, but in addition to the constitution, North Korea is governed by the party. North Korea's Workers' Party of Korea is quite different to the normal or general communist parties of the other countries. Because North Korea's Workers' Party of Korea has a very different political policy, which is called 10 Principles of the Party. In North Korea, exact term is monolithic ideological and guidance system, which actually establishes standards for governance and guide for the behavior of North Koreas. But I want to mention that, you know, this 10 principles is 
the North Korea's version copy of Ten Commandments of the Bible. So if you go to the internet to Google and compare the difference between the Ten Principles of Workers' Party of Korea and Ten Commandments of the Bible, you can easily understand how North Korea you know, copied the Ten Commandments of the Bible and applied to its political you know, structure of North Korea. North Korea's Workers' Party of uh, Korea, led by uh, Kim uh, family, and in North Korea, you know, Kim family is regarded like the god of North Korea. North Korea loves the word eternal. So, for instance, North Korea, the children and adults are taught that human being has two lives. One is physical and the other is political. Political life is eternal, while physical life is dead when you are actually dead and buried to, uh, the, to the ground. So that is one of the reasons North Korea loves the word of eternal. For instance, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, Kim Il-sung, uh, he is the founder of North Korea. Now he is called the eternal president. Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, is now called the eternal general secretary of the Workers' Party of Korea. So, actually, North Korea claims that it is a socialist you know, state, but ironically, the whole system and political structure is not based on materialism, but actually it is based on idealism. I would like to mention something about legislative power and executive power. Of course, there is a legislative power in North Korea, which is called Supreme People's Assembly. And there are 687 members, but they are elected every five years by universal suffrages. But these kind of elections is actually a sham elections. They are not elected, but they are all appointed by Kim Jong-un. There is also executive power in North Korea, which is called Cabinet of North Korea. But actually, the members of the cabinet and premier is also appointed by the Kim Jong-un. So, at last, I would like to ask you how we can read the North Korea's political structure. Is it Stalinist dictatorship or hereditary dictatorship? There are a lot of arguments about it. Uh, I would rather describe North Korea's political you know, structure as kind of you know, hereditary uh, system. Even though there is a constitution and even the North Korea's official name is Democratic People's Republic of Korea, but everything in North Korea is appointed by Kim Jong-un. So this, this kind of political administrative structure is nothing but the present, you know, the dynasty and absolute monarchy. And uh, that is just my, you know, brief introductions about uh, my North, about uh, North Korea and now you know, uh, this is my just a brief introductions about North Korea. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to Casey. be with you again. Yes. And uh, okay, if you are watching this session, if you have any questions, now is the time to start typing them in. And I'll be watching and, and we'll ask some of the questions. Uh, but I'll start with a question. First of all, you were a member of the elite yes. of North Korea. Uh, I assume you were having a very nice life. Yes. But you escaped. Yes. Hey, so uh, I have a lot of reporters who contact me and they'll ask, you know, why does anyone in the elite escape from North Korea? 
So what was the uh, motivation for a you? A very good question. You know, I uh, spent a very peculiar life in North Korea. I, as I is introduced, I was a diplomat. So the life of diplomat in North Korea, first I can say that I uh, didn't have any uh, economic uh, difficulties, yes, compared with other North Koreans. And uh, my family, uh, together with me, actually uh, traveled between North Korea, Pyongyang, and European capitals every four or uh, three years. So uh, at the first, you know, in my first post, uh, I actually did not quite uh, well understand about capitalist system of Europe, and we, I was uh, too much brainwashed. But the more I spent my life as a diplomat in Europe, I started to doubt about North Korean system, all the brainwashing educations which I had, and I started to you know, study about Europe, new philosophy, new ideology, new uh, political structures. Then I learned that, you know, everything in North Korea is, you know, a sham. Uh, uh, this is quite, you know, against the humanity. Uh, so that is what I learned. But actually, this kind of, you know, uh, the new knowledge about the world does not, did not end of my defection. Uh, the main uh, trigger during you know, the reason of my defection is my uh, children. I have two sons. Uh, they had a similar you know, experience like what I had. Uh, they studied in British uh, schools, primary and you know, the high schools. And they also uh, uh, led a two or four years life in London and another two or three or five years life in Pyongyang. So they were actually, you know, uh, shattered between Pyongyang and London or Denmark and uh, Stockholm. So once, you know, uh, they are grown-ups, uh, they realized that their life in North Korea uh, was nothing but, you know, the contemporary current, you know, the slave mm. of the system. I, I believe you, when they would ask you about it, you would tell them that's right. the twist. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that's why, as a father, I thought that uh, I should, you know, cut uh, this chain of, you know, slavery for my uh, children. So that is the main reason I defected to uh, South Korea. So I learned that freedom is much, you know, the pressure, more precious than economic, you know, the welfare. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming through, but one more I want to ask you. You said that you were brainwashed. <laughs> Do you ever see videos of yourself speaking on behalf of North Korea? Yes, yes. And when you see yourself, what are you, what are you thinking? Of course, uh, the, uh, you know, I, there were a lot of, you know, my activities uh, when I was in London. But uh, at that time, I led a double life because that is a kind of official event uh, with the uh, British pro-North uh, you know, Koreans. So uh, I had no choice, but I uh, should try myself to defend North Korea's, you know, the systems and ideas. Otherwise, you know, I would be, you know, called back to Pyongyang immediately, you know. I uh, had been clearly watched by the North Korean system. We already have some questions, and we'll start with Sandia, one of our volunteers in the USA. If something happened to Kim Jong-un, what do you think would happen in North Korea? I think uh, for the first few months, there would be a great chaos because a North Korean uh, political structure is based on one man's control. Even though there is a, a party, political party, but the party is a kind of political instrument uh, which uh, dictates one family's dictatorship. So Kim Jong-un is dead. Uh, maybe for a certain period of time, maybe his sister Kim Yo-jong uh, would uh, replace him, but I do not think that uh, this replacement would last long, and there would be a little bit, you know, political uh, the ambiguity. I'm absolutely sure that there would be a political power struggles among the leaders, so there would be a political, I think, the uh, 
chaos for some time, but I think in a very short span of time, uh, someone, I don't know who, uh, would you know, uh, take up the leadership of North Korea. And nine out of 10, I think the military uh, will lead North Korea for the time being. Okay, so there you go. The military will take over eventually. Uh, we have a question from Brent Paul, one of our supporters. How much, okay, <laughs> a little sarcastic comment question here. How much does Kim Jong-un actually get done on a given day? So he says, I've always pictured him as a man child who just plays all day and makes everyone else do any political work for him. So what is he, so what's like a typical day for uh, the dictator of North Korea? Oh, uh, what is clear is that Kim Jong-un uh, didn't go to any North Korean schools, yeah, uh, because he was, uh, he and he, uh, uh, his sister and his brother, these, uh, the, the, they were uh, totally isolated from the whole uh, part of North Korea because uh, they were not the official children of uh, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-il is regarded as a kind of, you know, or the, uh, the god of North Korea. So how uh, was it possible that the leader like Kim Jong-il had uh, several families, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah, according to North Korean law, uh, it is, you know, one wife and uh, one husband system. So these children were totally hide uh, from the whole part of North Korea. So he didn't go to any primary or middle or university of North Korea. And when they reached a certain age, they were sent to uh, Switzerland with different names. And they uh, spent their uh, childhood in uh, Switzerland. So it's very interesting that uh, Kim Jong-un has many foreign friends, but not you know, North Korean, North Korean uh, the friends in his age. Yeah. OK, all right, there you go. Uh, and I will follow up first with a question related to the talk before. So June, also one of our supporters, asked, Hi, Mr. Tay. May I know when did you realize you were taught untruths in North Korea? And how did you feel about discovering the truth? Mm. Uh, usually the discover of truth uh, does not you know, happen like you know, this, you know, slow and slow. Uh, because you know the education I received in North Korea is based on Marxism and Leninism, and the theory I le we learned is, uh, according to economics, you know we learned uh, until the Adam Smith, you okay. know, uh, <laughs> so there is no any case or whatever. Okay. So uh, we and I was learned that the capitalist system is just a jungle law. So when I was posted to Denmark in 1996, I expected that uh, the beggars in the streets, you know, the uh, workers are extremely exploited, you know, by the, the capitalists. But when I arrived at Copenhagen, I was surprised to see that the people there were so, you know, the rich, uh, they go to school without paying any, you know, the, the, the money when everything is covered by insurance when you go to the hos hospital. They have, you know, national health insurance system. And when I went to London, it was also another, you know, uh, the society because uh, when I was in North Korea and when I was young, I read a lot of English novels, uh, you know, but those novels which are allowed in North Korea are all the novels in, uh, in Charles Dickens period. Right. So there is a lot, all the sad stories, yes. you know, Jane Eyre or... But that's what you would tell your sons to, to right. read yes. Oliver yes. Twist. And yes, to yes get that's up. right. Okay. Yes, but when I arrived in London, I was, first of all, I was surprised that national health system, NHS system, which was a surprise to me, the uh, British government even offers uh, the free medical care even to foreign uh, diplomats as well, okay. you know, so, and the education is free. So I, how was it possible? So I started to learn about the British economics, and then I learned that when the capitalism reached a certain level of development, uh, the government 
actually redistributes the taxes for the welfare of the system. So the welfare system goes together with the, the capitalist and you know, all free markets. So that is that part which I didn't know in the past. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then I wonder uh, two questions. One is. So that was 1996. You didn't have an understanding about what the outside world was like. What would a diplomat today, leaving North Korea, how much understanding would they have? And then the second thing is you mentioned about the free health care. Um, North Korea has free health care. That's what they say. But what's the reality? Uh, first of all, uh, North Korean uh, diplomats in, uh, know very well that North Korea is not the system which uh, was described by the state or the party. But the reason why they do not defect like me is that North Korea uh, now, even now, uh, exercise the policy of uh, association, guilt you know, by association. So uh, one, at least one of the uh, children of all diplomats are kept in Pyongyang as a kind of hostage. And if you defect, you know, your parents or your uh, brothers or sisters uh, may be heavily uh, punished. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though you are free to defect, but because of this, mm -hmm. you know, the policy of guilt by association, mm -hmm. you can't make up uh, your, your decision right. to say goodbye mm -hmm. uh, to but, this system. But in that case, you got but, lucky. Yes, but I was oh, very lucky. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when I arrived in London 2013, uh, I was there with only with my second, you know, the child. The first one was kept in Pyongyang, mm. but miracle happened mm. in 2014. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, Kim Jong Un uh, allowed the university students of North Korean diplomats may go and join their parents mm. to continue their study in foreign universities. Mm. So that's why my son was released yes, from okay. this captivity in Pyongyang, mm. and he was able to come to London. Mm. So I, I thought, now, <laughs> now this is the, the chance okay. given by the court. Why now my son is in London? Mm. There is no point for me, you know, to go on uh, to be loyal to this uh, the system. <coughs> mm. And then about the free medical care in North Korea. Okay. Yes. Oh yes. Oh, uh, North Korea is a free medical care, but a uh, the North Korean system is so poor, so that's why the government uh, does not have any budget for this free medical system. So actually, when you want to go to uh, visit the doctors in those government-owned hospitals, uh, you uh, had to bring some of the bribes to bribe them. And when they write the inscriptions, you go to pharmacy, there is no medicine at all. That's why you, go, you have to go to free market and you have to pay you know, for that. So that's why, uh, uh, even though it is called uh, a free medical care, but uh, virtually it right. is a very heavy, you know. Yeah. I've even heard that the patients have to pay, um, buy lunch and dinner yes. for the doctor, so right. it's not free. Okay, then let's go back up to the top. I missed a couple of the questions here. Okay, so uh, Irene, one of our supporters, asked, Mr. Tay mentioned the North Korea Party's commandments are based on the Bible. Mm. And was this done intentionally? I thought Christians were persecuted in North Korea. Uh, yes. You know, there is no any uh, religion in North Korea, Official. uh, officially. Yeah. Of course, in constitution, uh, constitution states that there is a freedom of religion. Uh, and religious practice in North Korea, but actually there is no religion at all. So even though the people in North Korea are uh, dictated to recite uh, all the 10 principles of parties, uh, monolithic ideological systems, but they do not understand that this is the copy of the 10 commandments of the Bible because North Korean people never read uh, the Bible. But so when I arrived in South Korea, I uh, was asked to read the Bible uh, in Korean version, and I was surprised to read this Ten Commandments because that is the exact, more or less, same as what I was taught when I was young, you know, in North Korea. Okay, so the answer is yes. And then okay, you asked about was it done intentionally? Right. Very good question. 
You know, uh, very few people knew uh, that Kim Il-sung itself was born in Christian family. His uh, uh, family in mother's line, they are, most of them are the priests or, you know, and Kim Il-sung's uh, father, uh, Kim Hyung-jik, he also graduated uh, the missionary schools and Kim Il-sung went to the churches until the age of 14. So to my, you know, the perception, maybe Kim Il-sung did not quite understand the uh, Marxism or Leninism, or even though he read a lot, but, you know, he did not uh, understand quite well. But because of this, uh, uh, his family's religious background, I'm quite sure that, uh, he may have well read all the Bibles, and so that's why he wants to be the God of North Korea. Right. So that's why he, you see, exactly applied what he learned in the churches mm -hmm. and also the Ten Commandments of the Bibles. Okay. So the answer is yes. All right. And then Bethany, one of our supporters, asked, how much freedom did you have while residing in the UK and other European capitals? Oh, as a diplomat? Yes, uh, uh, for instance, uh, maybe uh, I can visit the shops uh, with my family or I can visit the hospitals with my family. My sons were allowed to go to British schools and also my sons were allowed to visit his British you know, friends' families, uh, the, uh, the birthday parties, you know. So that's why uh, my family, uh, enjoyed uh, comparatively more freedom in London than in North Korea. Okay. All right, and Rachel, another, wow, some of our supporters are here, great. Uh, what are North Korea's long-term goals? Will they make reforms to rejoin the global order in a more legitimate status? Oh, uh, North Korea, the main reason why North Korea cannot join the world community as a normal state is this because of this uh, hereditary dictatorship, because there is no internet in North Korea. So why? If there is internet, then people may read, you know, what is going on outside the world. They may easily understand that 10 principles which they uh, have to, you know, <coughs> observe are the North Korean version copy of, uh, see, the Bible, uh, they may easily understand the basic, uh, the management, uh, the style of North Korea is the copy of the churches. So, and they learned that North Korea is one of the poorest countries in the world. So that's why they may lose, you know, the trust and faith in Kim family. Then what would happen? They would rise up for the change of, you know, political system of North Korea. So Kim family, <coughs> is afraid of this kind of change. That is the main reason why they cannot open North Korean doors to the world community. Okay, well, somewhat related to that, a uh, person with a bunch of numbers and letters in their name, before leaving for your first post, yes. how were you trained to view the world? They must have, I don't know, extra brainwashing before you left to make sure you wouldn't learn or be um, changed by what you saw when you all signed. So how did they get you prepared before you left for the first time, and then did they try to paint your perception so you would not view capitalism as superior? So did they try to do any special brainwashing of you before you oh, left? Yes, uh, uh, North Korea's education is, is totally uh, based on uh, the personal cult of uh, Kim family. They uh, does not, uh, they North Korean education system does not teach the truth so, and as I said, North Korea is totally isolated from the world. So the textbooks, the novels, the informations uh, you get are all uh, state-managed uh, ones. And uh, the novels which, foreign novels which are allowed to be read is the novels uh, written by uh, the novelists, you know, uh, maybe 100 years ago or 200 years ago, Novel, something like American novel, Gone, you know, with a wind, you know, yeah, right. or, or uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, right. okay. uh, Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist. So the general image of North Koreans to the outside world is like, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin, yes. 
right. or oliver trees, yes. you know, uh, these things. So uh, North Koreans actually are forced to live in the concept of 19th century. Okay, great. Okay. Ah, Brent, again, are there any real friends amongst the elite in North Korea? So when you're working abroad as a diplomat, did you get along with your colleagues? What kind of relationships did you have? And how was it talking to the people you worked with every day? Oh, North Korea has a very uh, uh, detailed uh, surveillance system. So even though you have a very good friends, even though you have your friends of beer or friends of wine or whatever, even though you are drunken, uh, you cannot actually open in your mind to your friends because, uh, you know, personal relations, are, when it is good, then, you know, it's okay. But sometimes, you know, you uh, may have quarrel with your friends or maybe this kind of friend should be, you know, broken or whatever. So in, in North Korea, there are many stories that your friends actually, you know, uh, tell about your uh, bad stories to the secret police or whatever. So they, North Korea is a very detailed surveillance system and North Koreans are used to it. So that's why even though you have a very good friends, it's very difficult to open your heart, okay. even to your friends. So you have to always protect yourself. All right. Uh, Evan Appleton, one of our, our, our number one supporter, actually. Uh, what do you think of the possible, uh, sorry, what do you think is the possibility of unification of the two Koreas? And then if it's going to happen, when will it happen? Uh, very interesting question. I think uh, now the reunification for Korean Peninsula is approaching us. Uh, that is because the change of young generations. Now, North Korean young generations in 20s and 30s, they are quite different from my generation and my you know, father's generation. Uh, why they're different? Because they do not have any this concept of solidarity with the Kim family or even those you know, old uh, generations. Uh, they are the ones who were grown up with computers and notebooks. Mm -hmm. So even though they are taught in schools that America is North Korea's sworn enemy, but they use computers and Microsofts or the systems which actually are made by Americans. Mm -hmm. And they are very loud. They, they love to learn English. And the second is that because of the IT revolution, outside information started to arrive in North Korea. For instance, in the past, if you want to watch South Korean dramas or films, you have to uh, buy a big, you know, around this size of CDs, and you, it's very difficult to hide in your body. But these days, if you want to watch South Korean <coughs> dramas, you, you just have this size of, you know, the SD card, which can be easily, you know, hide. And the Chinese are actually the factory of the world. That's why they uh, invented and they produced many uh, tailor-made uh, North Korea's, you know, the items like North Tail or whatever, which can available uh, North Koreans to watch South Korean dramas and films. So these young generations in 20s and 30s, they were uh, the ones who were grown up in this kind of, you know, different cultural atmosphere. They use different, the North Korean dialect, similar with South Koreans. They have uh, very much influenced by South Koreans, uh, the cultural context. So that's why I think when they arrive at the important posts of North Korea's political structures, army line or whatever, then I think these young generations would make a change. And this may kind of changes in the future would lead to uh, Korean Peninsula's reunification. And as for the time sequence of when, uh, I may predict that <coughs> maybe uh, within uh, 20 years, I think, yes, I can expect this kind of great dramatic change in Korean Peninsula. Okay, I'm going to skip over to a different question that's related to this. Um, sorry I, if I pronounce your name incorrectly, Hinoch. So keep the screen there, but I want to skip one question. Okay, um, Hinoch, I guess, asked, 
I'd like to ask why the North Korean people and the military do not revolt against the party and if there are political factions that do not support the country's totalitarian regime. So this is probably a common question. Oh, you yes. See? Yeah. Very good question. You know, North Korea is very heavily, you know, militarized, uh, the state. There are active 1.2 million military soldiers and an army officers. So uh, the probability, you may think that the probability of uh, military revolt may be possible, but uh, in North Korea, the military is uh, very much uh, divided uh, uh, from you know, units to unit. For instance, in South Korea, all military is under the control of uh, one uh, command system like uh, general staff uh, of uh, uh, general command of the staffs, you know. But in North Korea, there is no uh, unique command system. For instance, the military along demarcation line is controlled by one system. The military outside of Pyongyang is controlled by another system. And the military and security policy forces in Pyongyang is controlled by another command. So the military is, the command is very much diversified in North Korea. So if there is a revolt, for instance, then this kind of, you know, uh, the revolt can only be possible when the commanders in these kind of different sectors mm -hmm. are, you know, communicating and, you know, act as a kind of, you know, one, you know, command. But in, under the current system, if one military revolt, it can be very easily, you know, suppressed by the military round. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the reasons uh, in current uh, military system, the military revolt is really unlikely. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask, have there been some attempted revolts, smaller scale, uh, within the country? The yes, past? there was yeah. a very a small scale of attempted, uh, but uh, so far these uh, small scale uh, attemptations were all were discovered in advance, and there were many you know, uh, the uh, suppressions and even persecutions of high military ranks. Uh, so, uh, so far it is not very successful. Right, okay. Now actually we have a book coming out later this year. Um, the title of it is My Father's North Korean Story. The author, what, what's the actual author's name? I forget, one he- Peter Oh. Han Hun Che. And you know his daughter, Han Bong Yi, you met her. Uh, in the past, and one thing that he said in the book is that escaping from North Korea is a revolutionary act. Yes. Because you don't have power within the country, and you can't have a re revolt within it. The one thing you can do uh, to rebel against the regime is to escape. Yeah. And I thought that was really a profound uh, point that he made. So, but within the country, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to get it done. So, okay, then. Um, Okay, so I'll go back up to Bethany. Her question, were North Koreans aware of the penal political labor colonies, Guanliso, yeah. uh, and how difficult did they feel about them? Uh, uh, in North Korea, uh, everyone is taught that the people are divided into two. One is people, they call it people. The second one is called anti-revolutionary elements. And when you are caught and sent to these, you know, uh, concentration camps or may, you may say uh, political prisoners, you know, the camps, uh, they are regarded as uh, anti-revolutionary elements. And according to North Korean theory, anti-revolutionary elements are not protected by the law and constitution. So the people are just scared uh, of these, you know, the arrests and sudden disappearance. So North Korea system is governed by this kind of a policy of terror. Okay. Okay. So when's the next South Korean presidential election? Is it 2022? Okay. So Tae 2027? Yeah. So will Tae Young Ho run for president? Oh, no, South you mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tae in 2027? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll be your campaign manager? Okay. Yeah. So will you run for president? Sorry. Uh, Mr. Asked, would you ever consider running for president 
South no. Korea. No, <laughs> I don't think so because I have to learn. I have to learn too much. You see, about I'm a actually as a politician, I'm uh, uh, very young. Mm. I am just in a uh, stage of uh, primary school, and I <laughs> I have to pass you know the middle and high and university. So I have to go a long way. <laughs> I don't know. I've talked to you about things. You talk about politics and economies and history the way lots of people talk about sports teams. So I think you being a bit humble now. Uh, okay, Ken Stewart, one of our big time supporters. I see pictures of all these older military men in full uniform with medals pinned on them from head to toe. Yeah. So what do they receive these for? What are all these different medals? Oh, it's a very good question. North Korean army has not been in the war or battle with the South Korea or any other parts, you know, in the past almost more than, you know, 65 years. But they have a lot of medals. But so, for instance, in North Korea, militaries are, are frequently mobilized for constructions or economic, you know, uh, uh, the uh, management. And when you, for instance, if you build a bridge, you know, even though it's a small bridge, you are just awarded medals. Okay. Yeah. If there is a military war exercise and you've done it uh, according to military textbooks and you awarded the, okay. the medals. So in North Korea, the military commanders are managed not by payment, but are managed and controlled by this, you know, awarding of medals. Okay. All right, the question's disappeared. Okay, thank you, team. Uh, okay, I'll skip this one. Uh, Aisha asked, is there a strict dress code North Korean people have? Yes. Mm. Uh, for instance, in North Korea, when you go to school, uh, you uh, have to wear a school uniform. When you go to university, university uh, students must wear university uh, uniforms. And... A uh, university is like a military academy of the other countries. Inside the university, you have to move in, you know, uh, units. And in uh, North Korea, uh, the, the class of the university is uh, regarded as very small, the last part of military, uh, something like paramilitary reserve, you know. So there is a very heavy uh, dress code. But the point is that uh, these years, the young generations do not actually, you see, observe this very heavy dress code. Uh, many of them wear uh, a little bit, you know, uh, South Korean style of uh, the uniforms. In North Korea, they have very uh, strict uh, hair, you know, the coat. Uh, children and the people are not allowed to have a long hair, but if you go to North Korea, you can easily see many people have, you know, a little bit, you see, long, you know, the hairs, you know. So even though there is a very heavy dress and hair coat, but uh, this kind of, you know, the coat is now more and more uh, uh, going to be uh, weaker and weaker. Okay. But, but why is that happening? What's the change within North Korea that they're not enforcing it as much or just so many people are doing it? Yeah, I, it, there are much more, you see, forces, but, you know, the people uh, just want to uh, imitate uh, uh, what they have seen in South Korean dramas or movies. That's why, you know, these cultural changes are taking place. Okay. Uh, Stanley, one of our supporters, asked, how can North Korea produce all these advanced weapons when the country is so poor? Uh, it's not just the money. What is the source of education for the scientists and industrial workers? Education and industrial workers and investment. Uh, as, uh, as I have said, that our North Korean constitution claims that North Korea is the single uh, and only legitimate government in Korean Peninsula, and their destiny is to reunite uh, the whole Korean Peninsula with uh, military forces. So that's why the government and the party invest all available resources for this uh, uh, the 
nuclear weapons and the armies. And another thing is North Korea is a socialist economy. That's why they can easily invest huge human sources for this uh, military, you know, the research and development. That's why, that is the reason why North Korea is so poor and still North Korea cannot solve the problem of famine. All right, uh, June, she says, hi, Mr. Tay. Have you been to the rural areas in North Korea? And um, okay, and did okay, and did those who are living in Pyongyang know about the living conditions of the rural people? And I, I will add to that the situations of North Korean refugees, because in North Korea you are part of the elite, yeah. and in South Korea you're also part of the elite. <laughs> and but some of our students who live in the countryside or whatever, and now they're in North Korea, when they've met you. They've said just how incredible it was because they would have never met you in North Korea. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, actually, you know, uh, my parents uh, were born in a countryside, and my grandparents they spent most of the time in the countryside. And I was grown up in Hesan, you know, that is the border city of uh, North Korea until the nine years old. And in my school up uh, period, I, from time to time, uh, especially uh, school holidays, uh, I was sent to my grandparents' house in uh, Myeongchon County in Hamgyong province. And uh, most of my relatives, they are still are living in Hamgyong County. So I think those countryside life is not uh, something remote, you know, the part of my life. Here in South Korea? Oh, yes. Of South Korea, you see, uh, I visit many uh, the places and some of the less uh, developed areas. For instance, uh, the week before the last, I went to Busan and I visited uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lowest you know, the income area of Busan, which is uh, one of the uh, area in uh, Yongdo, uh, and the reason I visited there because because that is the part where the North Koreans lived during the Korean War. So from time to time, I visit some of the uh, the local areas. And for instance, this is now winter period. So during winter period, as a politician, I had to visit some of the vulnerable, you know, uh, the uh, the people. And also I uh, do, we call it, uh, uh, how to say in uh, English, uh, there is some of the, you know, the poor people, they do not use uh, the electricity or uh, uh, steam uh, radiators, but they burn coals, uh, ready-made, uh, tailor-made coals. So uh, as, you know, the politicians, I, from time to time, I visit to those people and give some, you know, the coals during winter period. So I learned that in South Korea, there are many rich people, but also there are many poor people as well. Okay. Now, the second part I ask about North Korean refugees in South Korea, because some of them struggle, and I, I know you've become aware of some of the challenges that they have here. So what is your experience dealing with North Korean refugees here in South Korea? Yes, oh, it's uh, still, it's a little bit sad story that the general income level of North Korean uh, refugees in South Korea is much, you know, the less than the general income of uh, normal uh, South Koreans. And because of the, you know, uh, education background and the past life experience in South Korea, uh, North Korean uh, the defectors uh, feel very uh, difficulty uh, to grow up, but uh, this is a capitalist, you know, the world. So that's why the competition is very strong. You have to work very hard. You have to uh, get the compete. So whenever I meet uh, the North Korean uh, refugees who are in difficulty, uh, I would like to tell them about the spirit of Minari, you know, I think you have seen the recent Minari film. You can easily understand uh, how the first, you know, South Korean generations in America, how they overcame 
those the, the difficulties in America as a first uh, immigrant generations. So the life of uh, immigrants, no matter whether you are North Koreans or Indian or Pakistan or African, or whatever, the life of the first generation immigrants are really, really difficult. So that's why you have to work very hard. That is the only answer, you know, uh, which I can give. Because state welfare system uh, does not solve everything. Okay, by the way, I'm working on a book right now with a North Korean refugee who she lived in the countryside. The title is Green Light to Freedom. I'm going to give you a copy of it. Please read it. Okay, all right. But she lived in the countryside, and she's now escaped to South Korea. I want you to read the book. Okay, all right. Uh, and then, ah, <laughs> so there's a question earlier about Kim Jong-un's typical day. Is he, like, on YouTube and watching the news? And if he is... Is it dangerous to give information about how North Koreans escape from the country? Oh, uh, first of all, uh, in Kim Jong-un's office, uh, there are many uh, TV channels like, you know, South Korean TV channels and Americans like CNN, DBC, uh, whatever. And uh, when I was in North Korea's foreign ministry, we call it uh, CNN and VOA, BBC, NHK system. That means that many North Korean uh, diplomats, uh, they translate everything broadcasted by CNN in order to report Kim Jong-un. And uh, I work sometime as a kind of radio team, and every day we translate, at that time we translated uh, all the news and the reports by VOA, BBC, NHK, and uh, we circulated uh, this uh, radio uh, report to North Korea's the whole uh, diplomats inside the foreign uh, the system. So Kim Jong Un and Kim family know very well what's going on in South Korea and worldwide, uh, even though they don't allow internet to North Korean people. And another thing is that you know yes, sometimes uh, a kind of you know the publicity of uh, North Korean uh, escapees in South Korea may make uh, their left families uh, dangerous. So uh, many of them are very careful about their publicity. Uh, but you know, uh, people like me, you know, uh, I do not actually, uh, I do not mind. So because you know, I think that it is my mission. Uh, to make change. Mm. But you, you, you have talked about what happened to your family after yes. you escaped. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, I continue to uh, say that maybe my sister and brother uh, might be sent to concentration camps and whatever. And in order to kill all my, you know, the testimonies and, you know, the interviews, uh, all of a sudden in April of... 2017, North Korea uh, invited a CNN team to interview my sister and brother uh, in order to tell that what I say to the world uh, or, you know, the lie. <laughs> so uh, I was able to uh, watch my uh, sister and brother in 2017, but uh, from 2018, uh, I couldn't see any uh, more, so I do not have any information about my relatives or my brother and sister in North Korea. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then just the final part of the question, I don't know if you answered, was, is it, okay, yeah, you did, actually, it's okay. All right, and then Brent, why is America North Korea's sworn enemy instead of South Korea? Why do they target my country instead of this country? Yes, uh, the first of all, uh, you know, North Korean, the, the political system and this hereditary dictatorship can only be possible uh, by making enemy of outside. Mm -hmm. And Kim family uh, wanted to be predicted as a kind of savior, you know, of North Koreans against this outside, you know, uh, the enemy. So the creating of enemy is 
one part of North Korea's mm. politics. Why America? <laughs> According to the educations I received is that America is responsible for the division of Korean Peninsula with the Soviet Union. That is the first. Second thing is that uh, North Korean army almost, almost occupied the whole Korean Peninsula in Korean War, but because of this America's intervention, mm -hmm. uh, North, the reunification of North Korea was not realized, so North Korea lost the opportunity of occupying the whole Korean Peninsula because of the America. That is the second reason. The third reason is that North Korea wants to do it again, you know, to occupy South Korea again, but America left its forces in South Korea in order to check and keep the peace on Korean Peninsula. So that's why still even now, North Korea educates uh, the, its population that America is the sworn enemy against North Korea. So if America did withdraw the troops from South Korea, what would happen? Oh, first of all, if there is no Americans in South Korea, then all of a sudden, uh, Kim Jong-un may rely on military adventurism because uh, so far, as long as there is America, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, will not take that kind of risk of adventurism. But if there is no Americans, then I think the probability of this military adventurism is really high. Why? Because North Korea uh, you know, is much, much poorer than South Korea. North Korea's conventional forces are weaker than South Korea's. But why Kim Jong-un tried to you know, invade South Korea if there is no Americans? Because he, uh, North Korea, heavily you know, is dependent <coughs> on China and Russia. So they think that once the war is broken out again on Korean Peninsula, then uh, Russians or Chinese, you know, cannot be, uh, you know, a kind of, you know, observer's play. They, they should, you know, uh, involved in this war. So if there is a, another war in Korean Peninsula with Chinese and Russian support on North Korean side, then North Korea still strongly believe that they can easily win uh, this war if they, you know, uh, have solidarity with South the China and Russia. That is so. That is really a very, you know, risky military adventurism. So in order to prevent that adventurism, I think American forces uh, must stay in South Korea. Okay. And uh, Ingrid, one of our volunteers, asked, "What are your recommendations for reading?" about uh, to learn about North Korea's history and theories of reunification. Oh, um, mm, let's see. So how do we, uh, too many things in one sentence here, but um, so let's just take one part. Um, I guess she might be focused on North Korean history. So if people want to read, I hope I'm getting it right, Ingrid, but North Korea from the North Korean view. Well, oh. I'm I don't sure. understand. Yeah, okay, I think, Ingrid, try again. Hopefully we can get back to the question. Uh, the next one is, speaking of dramas, what do you think of portrayals of North Korea in South Korean entertainment? And do you think, uh, and do you think if North Korea ever lost the support of China that the regime would collapse? Yeah, first of all, uh, in, there are a lot of, you know, uh, the portrayals <laughs> in South Korean dramas and movies of North Korea. Sometimes I do not agree with because they just want to make fun, you know, <laughs> of North Korea, especially the dialect or the culture. But there are some very good dramas and movies about, you know, uh, inter-Korean relations or about the North Korean people. So I think uh, uh, the, the portrayals by South Korean movies or dramas are, you know, case by case. You know, there is no any uh, standard, you know, the comments on it. And, and I'll ask two, two questions. Uh, so number one, what about the portrayals in North Korea of South Korea? I mean, I, some people say they don't even talk about it, but there's some occasional dramas and features that show South Korean life. I think it's probably pretty negative. And then, of course, I have to ask if you watch Squid Game. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I watched this, uh, the Squid Games, and even South North Korean media has mentioned about this Squid Games. Yes. Uh, North Korea said that uh, this Squid Game is the exact, 
exact you know, portrayal of extreme capitalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, of course, you know, the, the Squid Game is uh, uh, in, in the concept of entertainment, I think it is you know, uh, good success, but uh, I don't think that the Squid Game exactly you know, uh, portrayal of South Korean reality because this skit game does not show about the welfare system of South Korea, which is uh, very good. There is no any, uh, uh, the government policy of caring these vulnerable people. They too much emphasis on, you know, uh, the competitions. Yeah, so yeah, just, well, just, I want to just watch it through entertainment, you know, the, uh, concepts, not just uh, whether it is reality. Or mm. Okay. Well, my prediction is that we're going to have the Squid Game escapee one day, who's going to come to South Korea and say, "I saw that I can make a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> in a game." So, because now people escape, not even trying to get money. But I think one day we're going to have someone, yeah, who escaped for that reason. Okay. Uh, and then the second part was about China. So, what would happen if China? Yeah, if North Korea lost the support of China, would the regime collapse? Of course, uh, definitely. Uh, North Korea is the only country in the world uh, whose uh, trade, 90% of whose trade is dependent on one country. Yes. So if uh, Kim Jong-un lose the support uh, from China, that means that North Korea uh, may be totally isolated uh, from the world. So I think with that kind of isolation, without, uh, without uh, Chinese help or trade with China, North Korea cannot, you know, uh, I think, sustain more than one or two years, yes. Okay. Uh, I think we have nine minutes left. Deputy? No, okay, we have nine minutes left, so a couple more questions. Oh, Kim Ji Hae with the, uh, okay. What do you think about the possibility of a woman coming into power in North Korea if something happens to Kim Jong-un? I think that is uh, what North Korean Kim Jong-un system is preparing for now. Uh, they, you know, in North Korea, they continue to say that the North Korea system must be managed and continued by mounting back to bloodline. So why they are saying about mountain back to bloodline again and again, if you say about mountain back to bloodline, it is Kim Jong-un, and after Kim Jong-un, it is Kim Yo-jong, until Kim Jong-un's son is grown up enough for the, you know, this, that succession. So that's why there is a probability if Kim Jong-un dies early and Kim Yo-jong may take up the post as a woman. But I do not think that, that Kim Yo-jong's, you know, the rule of North Korea may last quite a long time, maybe for a temporary one or two years, of course, but in, in, in a very short uh, span of time, I think there would be a great change, power, you know, the struggle and the structure in political systems. Okay, uh, this is not a question, but I have to read it. Uh, wait, 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 go back up. Nope, you did the wrong thing. Okay, all right, so, Im Jong Ryong, oh, says, thank you for organizing a great event. It is truly an insightful and interesting event. We respect you, Professor Casey Lartig. <laughs> <laughs> I teach public speaking at Seoul University of Foreign Studies, so thank you so much uh, for that comment. Uh, and then Donald Kirk, longtime journalist covering Asia for like, I don't know, since 1965, I think. Um, what do you think of calls for an end of war agreement or even a peace treaty, and will Kim Jong Un go for it or honor it? Because a lot of there's some people, you know, I, I think you know about this, say that we just need a peace treaty between the two. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, it is sure that you know end of war declaration uh, could play as a kind of bridge uh, to a peace, final peace arrangement of Korean Peninsula. That there is no doubt about it. But what kind of end of war? you know, uh, declaration. That is very important thing because North Korea wants to achieve uh, something from this end of war declaration. Mm -hmm. What they, they have, North Korea has different strategies, what they want to achieve from end of war declaration and what they want to achieve from a peace treaty. Okay. 
in end of war declaration, North Korea wants to uh, reach two goals. One is dismantlement of UN command in South Korea. The second one is the accept North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear status. So they want to uh, reach these two goals. The first one, US command. No, UN command in South Korea. According to Armistice Treaty, uh, there is no exact, you know, the legal, you know, the clause that a UN uh, command must uh, stay in South Korea. So if end of war declaration uh, takes place, then that is the end of war. So North Korea will continue to argue that since the war is end, what is the, you know, the merit and the reason of us uh, continuing UN command in South Korea. The second one is um, North Korea now wants to achieve the principle of mutual respect by the end of war uh, declaration. Uh, armistice agreement is uh, just a temporary stop of the war, but end of war means it's a kind of uh, announcement that both two sides would not attack or uh, invade. So this end of war declaration must be based on the principle of mutual respect. Now is the time that whether we can accept this mutual respect, you see, through end of war declaration. For instance, President Moon Jae-in said that even though end of war declaration is enacted, there would be no change in security structure of South Korea where ROK and U.S. military alliance and uh, U.S. forces stationed in South Korea play a uh, deterrent role in South Korea. But President Moon Jae-in did not mention about what would be the, you know, the future of U.N. command in South Korea. In return, North Korea wants to uh, be respected that the North Korea's security structure, which is based on the nuclear weapons, so North Korea wants to trade with these two security structures with the South Korea. One is ROK and U.S. military alliance to trade with the North Korea's uh, security structure based on nuclear weapons. So the, now comes the question whether South Korea, together with America, can reach a principle of mutual respect of the other's security structure. That is the question. So uh, I think if we accept these arguments of Kim Jong-un and North Korea, then that could be a very, you know, uh, risky trap, you know, for Americans and South Koreans. So we should be very careful on it. Okay. All right. I'm getting the signal that we should wrap up. Uh, okay. It's been really, really informative really want to thank you for coming out and participating in our event. I don't know if you have a final statement you'd like to make. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it's nice you see, meeting you, and I think I really appreciate uh, this kind of talk. Uh, and I uh, really, you know, want to go on this kind of, you know, the free talk with Casey. Casey, you know, so far has been a very helpful not only for English education for North Korean escapees in South Korea, but Casey actually helped many people uh, to go to America to continue their study in America. And uh, I want to join everyone to the project, you know, uh, managed and initiated by Casey. All right, thank you so much. Freedom Speakers International and co-founded by with uh, Ms. Ungu Lee. Uh, thank you so much. Our team has grown and we even have people, great people like you okay. participating in our event. Thank so you. thank you so much. Okay. Again. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see you soon. Yeah.